Hello, my name is Natanya Padachi. I'm a practicing endodontist in Victoria, BC, Canada. And I'm able to help my referring doctors on a regular basis with their questions about diagnosis because there are times when these are difficult waters to negotiate. Diagnosis and treatment planning are two of the most important facets of the whole field. Without accurate diagnosis and proper treatment planning, all other aspects of this discipline really become of little importance. So we all know a clinician can perform the most skillful treatment, but if it's on the wrong tooth, then you may find yourself drowning in those difficult waters. There's been a lot of change in the last several years due to the developments in science, technology, and understanding. So let's take some time now to go through a thorough review of this process. These are our primary diagnostic objectives. If the first two of these can't be done, then the astute clinician doesn't proceed with treatment. It's where the process starts. So these objectives are to reproduce the chief complaint, determine the cause of that chief complaint, and eliminate the cause. Our ultimate goal here is to help our patient's symptoms and prevent and eliminate the endodontic disease. Always remember that despite a thorough assessment, the clinician may or may not be able to determine the exact nature of a patient's chief complaint. It's at this point that you have to remember the Hippocratic Oath says, do no harm. It's acceptable and even ethically required that a clinician not guess at the diagnosis when you need to refer or ask your endodontist. So the standard diagnostic framework that we use today is the SOAP format. The subjective information refers to what the patient tells you, what the patient's chief complaint is. Our objective findings are what we see as clinicians and the results of our testing of that. The assessment is when we put that information all together to come up with a formulative diagnosis and our treatment plan follows from that diagnosis. We want to know, do things match up? Do what the patient tells us and what we see matched up? And are they backed up by those results? That's where our di diagnosis comes from. So the first step, of course, is always a medical history. Uh, it should be signed and reviewed by every clinician. And be careful of certain things in this medical history as well that may affect your endodontic diagnosis specifically. Say, for example, a patient takes an arthritic drug. Uh, that drug may or may not mask the symptoms that they are either complaining about or the results of your testing on that day. Starting with the chief complaint, this is how I like to ask the question. The chief complaint should be written in the patient's own, own words and I like not to lead them. I ask them, what brings you here today? Or what's the problem that you brought you in to see me today? And let them speak and address the problem. It's not uncommon for patients to have multiple problems and here it's important to be careful to listen to which are the problems that are endodontic in nature and which may be related to something that is not endodontic and relate, related. So in terms of the chief complaint, this is what we want to know about their symptoms. Once they've described them and you've got that quote, now we want to get into the details of that. We want to know the history, the location, the severity and the nature of that symptom. We want to know the frequency with which it occurs, whether it's spontaneous, whether it's um, triggered, and we want to know how often it's happening. So going into the details of the chief complaint, we want to find out all these various aspects of their pain. So the history of the pain. When did their pain start and how has it progressed? Ask them whether the pain is related to a specific incident. Did something happen? My dentist just put in a filling or I bit down on something hard. In terms of the location of the pain, we want to know, is this pain localized to one tooth? Can that person point to the tooth specifically in their mouth? I often ask people, where's the pain? And they say, oh, it's the second tooth from the back. When I, but when I get them to point to that tooth specifically, they'll point to a different tooth. So be aware of that. The pain may be localized to one quadrant. It may be localized to one side of the face in which case we may or may not be dealing with an endodontic problem. And of course, where people complain about a symptom that is on both sides of the face, we can be fairly assured that that's not going to be an endodontic problem. In terms of the severity of the pain, it's nice to have a scale that's reproducible. So ask them on a scale of one to 10 what their pain is like and how it's been progressing. One, you can say, is no pain and 10 being the worst pain imaginable. And it's a subjective judgment on that patient's part, but comparing from time periods this week versus next week, you will have some idea of the time course of their pain. 
Ask them to describe that pain. Is it throbbing or burning or shooting or sharp? These again are very subjective descriptors. However, uh, there is some indication that different types of pain, endodontic versus neuralgic versus muscle pain, may have different natures in their pain. We want to know the frequency of their symptom. Is it something that happens from time to time or is it there all the time? And if it happens from time to time, how often does it occur and for how long is each episode? Is the pain coming on by itself? This may be an indication of some irreversible pulpitis as we know that waking the patient up at night, um, severe tooth pain that's spontaneous. Is the pain triggered? Is it something that needs a stimulus? Perhaps it only happens when they chew. And this could be an indication of pulpitis, but it could be an indication of something non-endodontic as well. Uh, it could be biting sensitivity from malocclusion or bruxism or a periodontal problem as well. We want to collect all this information and get it together to make our diagnosis. We ask them about the stimulus of the pain. Is it cold, biting, chewing, pressure? Get that, them to tell us. We're going to figure the rest out in our testing specifically, but we want to know what they think and what they're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. In terms of the pain, when they're having episodes, how long does the episode last? In particular with cold, we want to know, you know, when you drink a cold glass of water, is that pain just last? 30 seconds, less than that, just while the cold's on there? Or is it something that lingers? Does it persist on? When cold sensitivity persists greater than 30 seconds or minutes or hours, we know that that's an indication of irreversible pulpitis. Moving on to our objective findings, this is what we as clinicians are going to find. We want to try to look for agreement or correlation between what the patients told us and what we see. So there are three parts to this objective segment. There's our clinical exam, our tests, and our radiographic assessment. So we want to start with things that are general and move to the more specific, and we want to document everything again. Starting with the extraoral examination, moving from the general to the specific. In the extraoral examination, we want to look for areas of swelling and asymmetry, possibly discoloration and anything else that appears not to be normal. I like to approach uh, the patient from the 11 or 12 o'clock position where I can look over their face to see if they have swelling of the cheeks or jaws or asymmetries in that area that may be difficult to detect when you're looking at someone straight on. Um, as well, this gives me a chance to do my palpation both of the neck nodes, submandibular nodes, submental nodes. We know that, of course, if somebody has pain to palpation of the muscles of mastica mastication, we may not be dealing with an endodontic problem at all. And on the other hand, if they are have tender or enlarged nodes in the neck or under the uh, jaw, then of course we may be dealing with spreading infection and something that is definitely endodontic in nature. For the intraoral findings, again looking for asymmetries, swelling, areas of redness or inflammation, I look to, like to compare the right and the left sides of the mouth and at the same time while we're examining these soft tissues, now's the time to check the palate and the tongue and do our oral cancer screening as well. Again, documenting everything. As far as soft tissue findings, um, one important sign to look for is a draining sinus tract. If a sinus tract is present, it must be traced with a gutta percha point and a radiograph taken. You will be surprised how often the draining sinus tract doesn't arise from the tooth that you think it should be arising from. In other words, the draining sinus tract may not be right beside the tooth in question. We want to look for general dental conditions. For example, wear facets may indicate the presence of strong occlusal forces and perhaps a parafunctional habit such as bruxism. And occlusal trauma is frequently misdiagnosed as endodontic disease, so this finding is very relevant. Another thing to note is recession and exposed dentin. Exposed dentin can be quite sensitive to cold especially, and it may be uh, an indication of reversible pulpitis. And if it's reversible, then this is something where endodontics is not ne needed and there may be a more simple solution. We want to look for caries. Of course, caries is a sign of bacterial invasion of the tooth, and if the caries and the bacteria are getting into the pulpal tissue, then we're dealing with an irreversible pulpitis, which will eventually lead to necrosis. 
We want to document any large or, or leaking restorations. We're again looking for the cause of the endodontic disease and the way that bacteria can get into the tooth. Areas of recession may be also associated with tooth fractures, and tooth fractures is another way that bacteria get into the pulp. Where there's recession, check carefully using magnification and a perioprobe to examine to see if there may be a fracture present on roots, especially below crowns. Fractures can also be detected using transillumination. So for this, I like to turn off my operatory lights, sometimes turn off my overhead light, and I'm shining light through the dentin of the crown and where there is a crack, that light transmission will be disrupted, and you'll be able to see that, that crack. So now that we've looked at the general oral conditions, we want to move on to our clinical testing of the suspected tooth and its entire quadrant. We're often going to find secondary problems or that symptoms are related to more than one um, thing. It could be endodontics and periodontics, for example. I like to consider the periodontal probe as the first instrument of my endodontic testing. It's a critically important step and many endodontists will tell you the same thing. Here we have a case, the patient was sent for endodontic treatment for a toothache. It's a good idea to consider measuring at least six points around the tooth and we also want to look for things such as are we dealing with an isolated pocket where we've got normal periodontal probing and then all of a sudden the probe drops into a 10 millimeter depth? This could be an indication of a fracture. Perhaps this tooth isn't savable. If we're probing at those six points and we find a broad area of bone loss, then that can be something that is periodontal bone loss. And again, we may want to refer for that or be looking at our periodontal support of that tooth to determine whether or not the prognosis for long-term outcome is good for this tooth. Palpation testing is done in the quadrant and it's done to detect periapical inflammation that's spread to the surface of the mucosa and it may indicate an underlying problem. I think it's useful also to note the precise area of the mucosa that may be sensitive. For example, if your patients are finding that they're sensitive but it's along the gingival margin, we may be dealing again with a periodontal problem, not an, an endodontic problem. And this is quite different from when they're sensitive to palpation at the root ends. Note the area and location of that sensitivity to palpation. Do be aware with upper molars particularly that there's a muscle insertion in this area at the root apices and patients will often say that this area is sensitive to palpation. Compare the right side and the left side in these areas to make sure there is a difference there. Percussion testing is used to more specifically examine for inflammation at the root ends. One should bear in mind, however, that this is in fact a periodontal test. Periodontal inflammation can be caused by endodontic infection. Certainly, if it's spreading to the apical tissues from the, from the pulp space, you're going to get sensitivity to percussion. But also things such as bruxism, malocclusion, parafunctional habits, these can also stretch and traumatize those periodontal fibers causing a sensitivity to percussion. Every tooth that's considered for endodontic therapy should have a cold test. Cold testing is an essential element of our tests. There are several ways that we can do it. So you can use water um, and water is ice. So to do this, you take your cleaned and disinfected empty anesthetic car uh, cartridges, you fill them with water, put them in a little plastic cup upright, and freeze them. And then when you want to take them out for your cold testing, then you make uh, little ice pe pencils which you can hold in a 2x2 two two gauze. When you're using this method, it is important to start with teeth distal and then move mesially because as you are testing, the ice will melt onto adjacent teeth and we don't want to get any false positives. So I like to use endo ice spray. It's a tetrofluoroethan spray and it's very convenient and easy to use. Uh, it comes out of a can, you spray it onto a cotton pellet or a cotton swab and then you can test the teeth very specifically and individually without having uh, melting where cold is transferring from one tooth to another. Do be aware that uh, as you're using the can the temperature can vary so give it a really good shake before you spray it onto your cotton pellet. 
CO2 snow, which is dry ice, can be used as well, but the temperature is very extreme and also you need a lot of armamentarium, a big canister in your office to be able to have that available. Now, a heat test, so if someone complains of hot sensitivity, then we should be doing a heat test and there are several ways to do that. One of the ways that you can do this is using a rubber cup um, and using creating friction on the tooth to create heat. Uh, I don't find this works as well, say for example, as using warm gutta percha on a tooth and a heated instrument or using a rubber dam test in hot water. The heat test when we're using a heated instrument or warm gutta percha is used similar to the way we would do the cold test where we hold that hot or cold stimulus on the tooth for about a second or until the patient feels that stimulus and then remove it right away. So when we're doing the heat test with a hot gutta percha and and a heated instrument, what we want to remember is to put a little Vaseline on the tooth first to prevent that gutta percha from sticking. When we're doing the rubber dam test, then what we're doing is placing a rubber dam and flowing hot water uh, onto one specific tooth at a time. So while rubber dam placement is not comfortable for everyone, you'd be surprised at how often you can get that on comfortably to be able to do a nice accurate hot test. There is equipment available as well that will have um, the ability to, to heat test. For example, the Calamus Dual has a specific heat test tip and you can apply that to teeth as well for heat testing. So we've used our thermal tests for vitality testing of the pulp. Another vitality test is the electric pulp test and it's unfortunately of limited value if you've got teeth that are heavily restored, which is often the case when we're testing for endodontic problems. So it's not all that frequently used, but it does become very important with trauma cases. And in trauma cases, we want to establish a baseline of what our electric pulp tests say and then follow that through over the weeks or months of follow-up assessments that we're doing. Bite tests are performed using a tooth sleuth or a similar instrument, a wooden stick or a cotton swab again. And a positive test result here may indicate periapical inflammation, but it may also indicate something like a crack, for example, in the tooth. So with the bite test as well, to establish your baseline of what is normal and where a patient may be specifically bite sensitive, it's a good idea to test all the cusps of all the teeth in that quadrant and again doing that in a random order. So do be aware with all of these testing, the percussion, the bite testing, and our temperature testing, it's a good idea not to go in order. Uh, we want to establish what's normal around the tooth before moving to the tooth in question, and we don't want the patient to necessarily anticipate the test result. Uh, with the bite test also, we have the advantage of being even more specific than that because these tooth sleuths allow us to place forces on specific cusps and we can document exactly where that sensitivity may be coming from. Selective anesthesia is not used often, but can be used where we have patients that are complaining of pain to the entire side of the face, where they can't tell if the pain is coming from a top or a bottom tooth. In this case, what you can do is anesthetize the arch that you think the pain is in. And if the patient's pain goes away entirely, then at least you know that that is the area from where the pain is coming. Now, if you're not able to eliminate the pain, then you may be dealing with pain from the opposite arch, of course, but also you may very well be dealing with a non-endodontic pain or a non-dental pain, which of course we can't anesthetize away. So to review some of the clinical tips, uh, just to note that blowing air is very inaccurate for cold testing, as can be the ice stick if you're not careful about it and letting the ice drips, ice uh, melted water drip. So use endo ice, something that you can use specifically to touch the tooth uh, in question and remove immediately. When doing the hot test, do put some petroleum jelly on the tooth to prevent the gutta percha from sticking. And be aware that anesthetic tests are not able to anesthetize just one tooth, but they are very useful when you can't tell whether pain is coming from an upper versus a lower arch. 
So moving on to our radiographic assessments. When exposing radiographs, it's a great idea to use some form of film positioning device. And this way you can get reproducible angulations. It's also good uh, because we're able to get a better view for endodontic purposes when we compare to using a bisecting angle technique, for example. So here's an example of a radiograph that was taken using a bisecting angle technique, which is on the left, and a radiograph taken by the endodontist on the right using a RIN device. So the suspected tooth is tooth number three. And we note that on the radiograph on the left, the zygomatic arch covers the palatal root end, and the buccal roots are quite foreshortened. So not as clear as I'd like to see to determine whether or not this is uh, the tooth in question, whether this is a tooth that has difficult anatomy. When I take look at the radiograph on the right, which is the one that was taken by an endodontist at the corrected angulation, we can see that there's extensive caries. It's approaching the furcation. There's a severe distal periodontal defect. There's quite a curvature of those mesobuccal roots. And the palatal root is, of course, easier to see and can see the, the amount of calcification there. The corrected angulation on the image on the right-hand side has enhanced clarity. And this may be a tooth that I want to think twice about what I'm going to do in my treatment, my endodontic treatment here. So we can also see how two different types of images can show two different types of information. And it's for this reason that in my office I always take two views of every tooth. And we take a straight on view and then a distal angulated view. Now, this also reminds of us of something we may have learned in dental school, which is the buccal object rule. So here's an example of a previously treated tooth, and we're seeing a periapical lesion on the mesial roots, and we're suspecting that there may or may not be a missed canal. Either way, we want to see more information about this tooth. The image on the right is a distal angulated view of that tooth. So the tube head is moved distally, to take the image of the tooth. What that will do is it will move all the objects that are closest to the tube head away. So my analogy for this is if you're driving down the highway, the trees in the front move quickly and they move by you fast. They, but the moon, which is far away, it stays relatively still. So in this second view on the right, what we see is the mesial root, which is filled, is closer to the distal aspect of that mesial root. It's not centered in that root anymore. So my suspicion is that there may be canal anatomy unfilled, which is centered in that mesial root, and that would be to that right side of that image, to the mesial side. So knowing that that has now moved away in my distal ang angulation, I know that that must be the mesial buccal root. And here in our post-operative view of that radiograph, we can see now both the mesiolingual and the mesiobuccal roots are both filled. We can use the same concept to move other objects away from root ends. So here we've had an orthognathic surgery and some pins and retention devices which are covering the root apices in our straight-on view. I want to move those um, elements which are on the front face away from the root ends. So by moving the tube head down, I can get those elements to move up away from the root ends. And there we can see the root apices. Now where we have foreign objects that we can remove, which is more common these days as well, nose piercings and lip piercings, do have patients remove them so that we can just see what we need to see in the image without it being obstructed. Reviewing some of our clinical tips. Perioprobe, it's your first instrument. Record your depths at six points at least. Also take an assessment of the mobility of the tooth, whether it's slight, moderate, or extensive. Remember that grade three mobility always refers to a tooth that can be compressed in an apical direction. With percussion and palpation testing and temperature testing, start with the uninvolved teeth and be random, working towards the involved tooth. 
get the patient accustomed to normal, perhaps test the right side versus the left side. For your imaging, remember you must always have a current image and you should show both the tooth and all its surrounding tissues. If there's a lesion present, you want to show the entire lesion in your radiograph. So we've gathered all the information from our patient and we've gathered all the information for ourselves. So now it's time to put everything together into our diagnosis. The diagnosis is actually separated up into um, two areas and then non-endodontic pathology, meaning there's something else going on. But the endodontic diagnosis, we want to look at the pulpal diagnosis and the periradicular diagnosis. So there are six classifications for pulpal diagnosis, and these are the first three. They have to do with vital pulp, pulp that is still alive, but may or may not be bacterially infected. So in a reversible pulpitis, we have sensitivity, usually to thermal, but it's not lingering and it's not spontaneous. This is an inflammation of the pulp. When we have irreversible pulpitis, this indicates a bacterial infection usually of the pulp and it's causing pain for the patient. It's symptomatic. We have got could have spontaneous pain or we could have pain that lingers after that thermal stimulus, lingers after cold and usually a very severe type of pain. We can also have irreversible pulpitis that is asymptomatic. This means that the, ba the bacteria have infected the pulp tissue but there are no symptoms and it's quite common as we'll see when there are deep caries and sometimes in trauma cases. So our pulp test would elucidate that there is an ind indeed an irreversible pulpitis even though the patient may not complain of that. So this is the second set of pulpal diagnoses categories. We have pulp necrosis where we have no response to thermal or electrical stimuli where we're able to take the electrical pulp test. We have previous root canal therapy where somebody's already completed a root canal treatment but the tooth continues or begins to be reinfected. And we have previously initiated therapy. Perhaps someone's been in there to start a therapy or to do some sort of emergency treatment, pulpotomy or pulpectomy. So let's look at some case examples of these last entities. So reversible pulpitis, we would usually find that we have no sensitivity to percussion and no sensitivity to bite because there's no periapical inflammation at this point. We've got a pulp tissue that's inflamed and it could have some cold sensitivity. Maybe if it's more severe sensitivity or starting to linger, we may start to think, well, is it moving to rever irreversible pulpitis? But if it's just sensitive for a short time um, without percussion or bite sensitivity, we're probably dealing with a reversible pulpitis and no endodontic treatment would be needed in these cases. When it's an irreversible pulpitis, then we start to get percussion sensitivity perhaps and bite sensitivity perhaps. Our cold sensitivity would be more severe and then we start to get that lingering quality. Patients may also have or not have heat sensitivity associated. When looking at a radiograph of a tooth that has irreversible pulpitis, we may or may not see some small signs in the x-ray. In this radiograph, there may be a sign of some condensing osteitis here, maybe a little widened PDL space. So do be aware of those changes as well. In an asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis, again, the patient's not complaining of any symptoms, but here we're seeing a quite a large carious lesion. It's very close to the pulp space, and our testing, we may either find that there's a response or a lingering response, same with the thermal testing of hot or cold, and again, we want to look for those radiographic signs. Perhaps we will also see some small signs of condensing osteitis or widened PDL space in a case like this. Once the infection progresses to pulp necrosis, now we're going to start seeing more signs of periapical inflammation. We're going to see bite sensitivity and percussion sensitivity, and sometimes that can be fairly minimal, but sometimes quite severe. Since there's no live tissue in the tooth at this point, we're going to have a negative response to both our cold and heat testing. In the radiograph, we see the signs of that periapical inflammation and periapical um, bone changes associated with infection as that darkness that forms around the ends of the roots. Looking at a previously treated 
to, uh, case, we may find that there is or is not percussion or bite sensitivity. It may be minor, it may be severe. Again, we're going to have no response to thermal tests because there's no living tissue in this tooth. But radiographically, we would start to see signs of disease, signs of endodontic infection. We've got periapical radiolucency. With previously treated teeth, we also want to look for other types of elements. Are we looking for caries? Where are there posts? Are there, uh, are there signs of fracture? Are there untreated canals? And going back to what I said to, uh, before about the radiographs, here's a really great time to have more than one view of a tooth. So, we've done our palpal diagnosis and now we want to move on to our periapical diagnosis. So we're looking at the tissues around the tooth. They can be normal, where they're asymptomatic, intact, and radiographically we have an intact lamina dura. We can have symptomatic apical periodontitis, which is pain to biting and or percussion, and it may or may not have an associated periapical radiolucency. We can have asymptomatic apical periodontitis. So this is where you can't elicit any pain or altered sensation by your tapping or your palpation, but radiographically we're seeing an apical radiolucent area. When we have an acute apical abscess, this is when we have a very localized swelling and pain and pus formation in the periradicular tissues. The tooth can be exquisitely tender to pressure. We can have fever. We can have lymphadenopathy. This is spreading infection, and it may or may not occur with periapical radiolucency. With a chronic apical abscess, there will be minimal or no pain because we're not getting that same pressure buildup like we do with the acute apical abscess. Here we've got pus, and it may be draining from a sinus tract, and now we're looking for draining sinus tracts. Facial cellulitis. This is when we have extra oral spread of an infection, and this is quite serious and quite dangerous. We want to treat this aggressively. We're going to see swelling of the face. There may be redness, tenderness, lymphadenopathy, fever, and tenderness to palpation extra orally as well. So we've covered the endodontic pathology, but there are other things that can mimic endodontic symptoms, and we want to be very aware not to create any misdiagnosis. So here are some of those entities. We can have periodontal abscesses or other periodontal problems, even food impaction, can mimic endodontic symptoms. Vertical root fractures, sinusitis, so pressure in the sinuses causing pressure on the ends of the roots and upper molars will sometimes cause a dental pain. We can have TMJ pain or muscular pain, and this can include occlusal trauma or parafunctional habits. Neuropathic pain, pain that's not actually occurring in the dental structures themselves, but in the nerves and in the, in the blood vessels around, um, around the dental tissues. And then we can have atypical facial pains, so pain that's associated with nothing dental at all. So all of those conditions listed on the previous slide can mimic endodontic disease. And you have to rule those out prior to instituting root canal therapy. If you're not sure, refer or ask. Many misadventures have occurred and thousands of unnecessary treatments performed because of misdiagnosis of non-dental pain. So now we're moving on to the treatment planning part of this presentation. We've got our subjective findings, we've got our objective findings, we've made our assessment and our diagnosis. So when we're looking at endodontic therapy, if we've assessed that we've got a tooth that needs it, then we can go ahead and do that endodontic therapy if the tooth is restorable and the periodontal condition is sound. If the tooth's not restorable or we don't have a good periodontal prognosis and we may want to consider extraction. And in cases where either you think the tooth is, is a is, presents a challenging case or you have any doubts about the diagnosis that you've made, then this may be a good time to refer. So let's tie all this stuff together and look at some cases. Here's our first case. We have a 28-year-old female Caucasian office worker. She's a lady. She comes to the office and she's obviously in a lot of pain. She's holding a cup of ice water and she doesn't look like she's slept in a very long time. We take the medical history and she's in good health. She's got a mitral valve prolapse and she's allergic to penicillin. So we do know that she does need to 
take pre-operative antibiotics before certain dental procedures. Gathering her subjective information. She says her pain started on its own three days ago, no triggers, and it's getting worse. It's a constant throbbing. And that when she takes anything hot, it gets worse even still. But her pain can be relieved by cold, which is why she's carrying that cup of cold water. And she feels some sensitivity to biting. She says the pain is a 9 out of 10 and is keeping her up at night. Looking at our radiographic analysis, we see a pulp exposure, carious lesion under an existing restoration, and possibly some condensing osteitis and some PDL thickening. So looking at how we could gather information and record our information in the chart, it's not a bad idea to have some sort of paper or digital uh, template that you can fill out. Here's an example of one. You might want to have the quote of what the person's chief complaint is as well, but we've got our findings. We've got findings about the tooth, findings about the teeth around the tooth in question, and then the results of our testing here on this uh, page. We know that the pain was severe. We know that there was lingering pain after heat that was relieved by cold. And our heat sensitivity in testing reproduced what the patient had as their complaint. So based on all of this, we know we have a symptomatic, irreversible pulpitis. Bacteria is invading that pulp and killing that nerve. And we need to get rid of it. So, in terms of our periradicular diagnosis, what is that? We've got mild bite sensitivity, we've got mild percussion sensitivity, and it's, again, reproduced with the test. The patient knows that when you tap on that tooth, that's the one. So we have a symptomatic apical periodontitis. And our treatment plan for this tooth is non-surgical root canal therapy and elimination of the caries on top, getting rid of the source of the infection and getting rid of the symptoms by getting rid of the bacterial infection of the root canal system. So now for case number two. We have a 34-year-old male. He's got a little bump. The crown was placed not so long ago. And we do our tests. Periodontal probing is all within normal limits, good bone support around this tooth. Percussion is positive, palpation negative, bite negative, cold test negative. We trace that sinus tract and our radiographic image shows that that sinus tract is draining from the mesiobuccal root of that tooth. So based on our negative cold response, we know that the tooth has no vital nerve tissue to feel anything. We're dealing with pulp necrosis, draining sinus tract, meaning it's got a chronic apical abscess. So our treatment in this case is non-surgical root canal therapy. And in this case, within days or weeks, the draining sinus tract will heal. Case number three, we have a 64-year-old male, again, an asymptomatic bump on the gums. Now our perioprobing, different from the case we just saw, we've got a 10 millimeter pocket, at least that, but it's a broad pocket. It's not something that's dropping down just into that area. It's a nice broad 10 millimeter pocket, or not so nice as the case may be. Patient is percussion positive, palpation positive on that route, bite negative, and cold positive. So cold positive response indicates that there is indeed vital and healthy nerve tissue in that tooth. So our diagnosis in this case is a normal pulp and a periodontal abscess. In this case, endodontic treatment is not indicated, but the question becomes, is the tooth savable from periodontal perspective? So our last case today is a little bit more interesting. Here we have a 48-year-old female Caucasian, and she's referred to the endodontist. She's a malpractice litigation attorney. Now, is that important? And, you know, the dentist may be thinking, well, I should refer this patient and I need to take better records. But the truth of the matter is that every patient should be treated exactly the same and those records should be the same for every patient. Document everything. It's always really important. And it will help you for your treatment and patient management um, moving forward always.
So for this patient, her medical history was non-contributory. She said there was a sore lump on her gums and her dentist tried to do a root canal treatment, but it hasn't helped. The clinical exam showed a tender swelling on the gum and it had been there for two months despite the previously attempted non-surgical root canal treatment. She describes that she's got a paresthesia, meaning she's got altered sensation of the chin, but no other pain. So I'd like to introduce with this case the idea of dynamic diagnosis. It's a concept that's very important to note in that diagnosis is an ongoing state. It doesn't just stop when the dentist picks up the handpiece. It's got to be continually verified and modified throughout the procedure, since sometimes findings and observation during treatment can cause the astute practitioner to change their diagnosis. And that's the concept of dynamic diagnosis. It's fluid and it's changeable. You want to follow the procedure until it's completed and healing has occurred. And this way, we're taking our provisional initial diagnosis to its end point. So going back to the case, uh, the, den the patient has this gingival swelling and the paresthesia. So here it's a nice idea to outline with a skin pencil the area she describes as having altered sensation. And you want to record that so as that area diminishes over time, which it hopefully will, you've got a record of that. So though it's rare also, just bear in mind that paresthesia in this area can result from endodontic infection and swelling that presses on the mental nerve, but that's not all that common. So looking at our standardized form here, we've got our dental findings and our test results, and we see that everything is consistent with a persistent endodontic disease. Radiographically, the significant findings include, we've got a leaking temporary restoration, so recontamination of that canal space, bacteria is getting in there. We've got thickened cervical level period on a ligament space, and that's consistent with occlusal trauma or root fracture or loosen, loosening of the tooth, and we've got a periodontal ligament thickening around the end of the root that's consistent with the endodontic infection. So creating our pulpal diagnosis. She has no pain, no response to pulp tests, and the dentist started the non-surgical root canal therapy, so we have previously initiated therapy. Periapical diagnosis, the tooth is tender to palpate, it's negative periariticular tests, there's drainage from the gingival sulcus, and the apical periodontal ligament th thickening indicates that we have a chronic apical abscess. So based on the pulpal and the periradicular diagnosis, the endodontic treatment was completed by the endodontist. It was done in two appointments with a high level of disinfection. The coronal seal was maintained throughout and a good temporary, well-fitting, well-sealed temporary was put on the tooth afterwards. No fractures were seen using the dental operating microscope and no other canals were detected. So despite our treatment, uh, the lesion never healed. And this is where the idea of dynamic diagnosis concept comes in. Reevaluation and performing another diagnostic sam sampling with reformation of a treatment plan is indicated here. So what are the patient's options? They were discussed and they are do nothing, non-surgical retreatment, extraction, or surgical endodontic therapy. And the patient here chose surgical endodontic therapy. Flap was reflected and an unexpectedly large lesion was filled with necrotic bony sequestra was found. It was curated, and the root end resection and filling of the first premolar was done. Just note here also that the cuspid root is hanging within this lesion, resulting in its pulp losing vitality. So that material, that granulation tissue and bony sequester that was sent to a qualified oral pathology service. And here's our new information for our changing diagnosis. The lesion was very, very large. There's bony sequestra found and they were removed and that doesn't usually occur with uh, lesions of endodontic origin. We've got our biopsy, we're waiting for that information and now that idea of that pre-existing paresthesia, we're starting to think of how that may not have just been swelling, swelling pressing on a mental nerve in the area. So the final diagnosis was a central giant cell granuloma, a non-endodontic pathology that in this case truly mimicked an endodontic infection. 
So following through on the dynamic diagnosis right to its end point, here, 26 months later, we've got complete healing following that surgical debridement, and the non-surgical root canal therapy was done on the, on the cusp of tooth. It was the one that was devitalized during the surgery. You may also note here that the patient, unfortunately, hasn't got their final restoration replaced, and it's 26 months later. So this tooth is definitely subject to coronal leakage, and ultimately, the potential for post-endodontic uh, infection in these teeth is really great we may not be at the end of the story here. So as you can see, diagnosis can be an area that can be really complex, but there are ways that we can simplify it. Take great notes and do things systematically and consistently the same. Do your testing and clinical examinations covering all bases from the general to the specific. Gather that information and put it together in a way that makes sense for an accurate diagnosis. If you're not sure, call your local endodontist, ask questions. But where you know the diagnosis, the treatment plan follows. And from a great treatment plan comes great treatment, and great treatment makes a happy patient. Thank you for your attention today.